Physicians have been using stethoscopes to hear inside your body, but that staple of healthcare could soon be a relic of the past, thanks to a handheld device that can see inside of you. Yeah, the technology could have a profound effect on the cost and the quality of the healthcare you receive. It's called the butterfly, and it's getting a major rollout right here in Rochester. So this one little device can do the whole body. That Dr. David out. Mitten is one of the first at URMC to give Butterfly a try. You know, what we're going to do is I've got the test in my pocket. Wow. All right. And, and, then gonna, the whole time. Look at that. and then I'm going to have the results are going to come up in my hand in this phone. Dr. Mitten, a hand surgeon, shows us what this handheld ultrasound that connects to a phone or tablet can do for his patients. So the nerve is right there. Mm -hmm. And so I'm going to measure that now. For Dr. Mitten specifically, the butterfly will essentially replace this nerve conduction machine that he uses to diagnose carpal tunnel. For the first time, we have the ability to look inside the human body really easily. And when you start to have that ability, it changes the way you practice medicine. And not just for hand surgeons. The menu on the screen shows just some of the options from cardiac to OBGYN. By fall, UR Medicine will be putting butterflies in the hands of all of its primary care physicians and UR home care nurses. And within four years, there will be thousands of butterflies being used across the entire system. What we're looking at is, can we provide higher quality patient care at a lower cost? So our metrics are really going to be things like, can we keep patients from being admitted in the hospital? Dr. David Waldman says the device is only part of this story. There's also the IT side, how the images will be automatically linked to a patient's electronic medical record and how all the information gathered across the system can be used to improve outcomes for patients, including those who've been hospitalized and don't want to go back. So right now, uh, post-operative, we know what our readmission rate is, right? So if we get this technology in the hands of our, of our home care nurses, can we change those readmission rates? Doctors here seem most excited about Butterfly's potential to do things they haven't even thought about yet. But we also know clearly that if you put this tool in the hands of, of clinicians, they're going to find new ways to use it. I think we'll see, given, given the atmosphere here of, of, uh, of inquisitiveness and the, the atmosphere of, of, of uh, academic investigation, we'll be learning a lot. Like how looking at our hands and wrists might someday help our hearts. So we're developing projects to look at the blood vessels in the hand and trying to diagnose things like cardiovascular issues. And that's what we're trying to figure out is, where is the limit on this? This is really fun for us. So you go to the doctor now and he or she sends you for an MRI or a chest x-ray or a CAT scan. Now the butterfly might prevent the need for that extra imaging or it might confirm the need for it. UR Medicine is the first to roll this out across an entire health care system anywhere in the world. They're a pioneer in this. I'm thinking of the ultrasound you get when you were having a baby. Right. This is a little different? It is different because of the portability, the connectivity, and the artificial intelligence that's mm. built into it. The real high hope for this, or one of the many high hopes for this, is what it might mean in third world countries and right here in the U.S., underserved populations in terms of better health care. Yeah, bringing it right to them. We'll have to follow up, see how it does. Yeah, very interesting. School districts are preparing families and staff for the very real possibility of life without masks for the first time in two years. This comes with some concern and some caution. And as Chase Howell discovered, some challenges as well. That's right, Don. The child psychologist I spoke to says it depends on the individual. Some kids may welcome the change as a breath of fresh air. For others, it could drive up their anxiety. State legislators took to the floor Monday to ask for the school mask mandate to be lifted. There is mounting evidence that there will be long-lasting effects on our kids. Whether we're talking about facial expressions that our kids can't read, which are an important part of human development, or the emotional toll that a child is subjected to when they're masked all day long. Others argue masking in schools is helping keep children safe. Dr. Joanne Pedro Carroll says once the mandate is lifted and masks become optional for school districts, the social emotional effects will really depend on the child. Child who may be in school and has some immune compromising condition 
may want to keep some distance, may want to keep a mask on. And that's, again, where I'm, I'm suggesting um, that these conversations occur between parents and children, about respecting people's different feelings about it. Danville School Superintendent says he's more concerned about the negative psychological impact masking is having on students. But he says the district is working now on ways to help students adjust. Simply want to make sure that uh, kids don't feel bullied and that other students do not pressure students with masks to, to take them off. We caught up with two Pittsford parents who stand on opposite ends of the mask optional debate, but their concerns are the same. I think relationships are going to be affected as kids get frustrated with each other. I think kids can sometimes be very judgmental with each other. I think that you're going to see tensions arise between teachers and students, between students and each other, and it's just not necessary. I just don't feel like it's okay to have different opinions anymore, and people don't like respect each other to, you know, feel differently. And I think that's going to translate down into our children. And, you know, I've already heard stories of people shaming kids for wearing a mask or not wearing mask. I've seen it. The Shenandoah School District in Albany has proposed a psychological transition before the mask mandate is dropped. They are the most frail and vulnerable among us, and there is real concern New York is failing when it comes to monitoring the care in nursing homes. An ironic white woman says she saw the need firsthand and believes in some way it contributed to her mom's death. Janet Dysonroth loved her husband, her family, and volunteering. Janet lived three years after her 90th birthday party. The months that followed would be the most heart-wrenching for Janet's family. She was totally disarrayed. Her hair, of course, they had no um, hairdressers. We found out that they had not been giving showers the entire time. They said they did not have a safe way to do that. Janet was sent to a local nursing home for rehab after breaking her hip. Two days after she arrived... COVID locked it down. Her family couldn't see her in person for seven months. And Janet would never go home. For us, it was more painful than for her to see my mother look in dirty clothes without socks. When COVID rules relaxed and Jean finally got into her mom's room, she says she was shocked by what she saw. A dirty bathroom in disrepair, broken outlets, stained furniture, and what appeared to be an infection on her mom's foot. Jean then began a long and frustrating search for help, contacting the home social workers and filing, she says, several complaints with the state health department, all to no avail. You have to go to the New York State Department of Health, go on their computer website and research and try to find where a complaint is. You find out it is almost impossible to report a situation. Jean's complaints among thousands, more than 13,000 nursing home complaints were filed with the state health department last year alone, more than 1,100 about local facilities. But some of that could be avoided. Senior advocates say less than half of all nursing homes have someone dedicated to spotting and solving issues. It's a critical piece of long-term care. Sometimes the, the problem or the condition is not just about one patient. So they are there to be the eyes and ears and report what they see and hear going on in the facility. Senior care advocates are calling on the governor to put $20 million into the federally mandated ombudsman program. The money would put someone in each nursing home once a week. Jean took her case directly to Governor Hochul, asking that nursing homes post visible signs with the state health department's hotline to report concerns. Jean's mom died three days after this video was taken. The loss compounded by what she believes was neglectful care and her frustrating fight to get someone to help her. I truly, truly do not understand why this does not tear at people's well-beings. I don't understand. Again, you would never permit it with a child. 
For all she went through, Jean's mom is one of the lucky ones. She had someone looking out for her. There are many in nursing homes who have no one. That's why advocates say an ombudsman needs to be in every nursing home in New York. There is no indication yet the governor will include that $20 million requested in the budget for that.